Welcome everybody. This is Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Community Call. This is the Tuesday call, uh, which is with the Microsoft speakers. Um, and we are adjusting this uh, agenda a bit to be not just about Microsoft 365, but also Power Platform, as we have seen from the title, because they are overlapping in many, 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 many cases. Now, today we'll focus on Microsoft Teams and Craft, but next week, as an example, we'll have some Power Platform PMs again dropping by on the call. So it's a bit depends again on the on the week of the week of the year, what are we actually cover? Now, today uh, we did um, once again have uh, had a, a small adjustments uh, on the agenda, unfortunately, but we do have two really, really cool demos still. So we're not gonna obviously cancel the call. We always will keep the call uh, regardless of potential last minute changes, but we were forced to reschedule uh, one demo for a later time. So we do apologize that because that's a small change on the promotional thing, which was promoted. But we'll again start with the latest updates and news on the Microsoft 365 platform and latest news across Microsoft blocks and around the different uh, announcements and not that much actually this week we'll do a crew photo with together mode in teams um, and then we'll have the real stars of today uh, who are john miller who's going to talk about introduction to microsoft teams toolkit v5 the new features and capabilities and then we have another presenter who's rohan angarari boda who's a microsoft craft hackathon winner uh, we technically will have four presenters uh in in this course uh, from the microsoft craft hackathon and valdek i'm putting you on spot is this the last one no we still have a one to come next week right one more one more yes exactly exactly which is really really cool uh awesome awesome community demos um and and people who have built magical stuff during the microsoft craft hackathon which is super super successful now as part of the the recurrent slides we always want to remind people on the assets which are available for you to get started so we have the microsoft 365 and power platform community videos channel uh, subscribe today on that one so you'll know immediately when there's something new to follow up and when the community call recordings are available that's highly convenient because you cannot access the recording directly directly from chat, even though it might imply that would be the case. Uh, now, we also have a relatively new LinkedIn group uh, for discussions and updates. Um, it's a great way of actually starting a discussion, asking help uh, or sharing your findings uh, within the community. And we have a lot of cloud advocates, MVPs and PMs uh, in there as well. We have our open source channels. Uh, we have a lot of, lot of stuff. A lot of our stuff is actually open source nowadays, which is awesome. And um, being uh, a, quite a long time in Microsoft, it's, it's been awesome to see the transition from a a non-open source company to an open source company. Um, and uh, it might be a bit difficult to, uh, however, find the relevant sample for you because there is so much available in a GitHub. And that's why we are surfacing all of our Microsoft 365 and Power Platform samples in a one centralized location. So you can easily go to one URL uh, with the SACMS community samples. And from there, you can easily find the relevant sample for you. Uh, we surface all of the Microsoft samples and community samples across all of the different Microsoft repos and community repos from this one centralized location really, really convenient way to know where to get started. And we, uh, if you're wondering that there's too many URLs to remember, AKMS Community Home is the one URL from where you'll find all of the different call information assets and all of that to get started. Now, uh, I mentioned about already the calls um, to be mentioned there. So just to recap, we do have quite a lot of community calls happening. So we have the Tuesday call, 8 a.m. Pacific time, every single Tuesday, except summer break and potential uh, winter holiday break. Um, but on summertime, we'll probably have one and a half months off again during this summer, just making sure that people can have a bit relaxed uh, summer and don't need to worry about joining on the call, uh, including PMs don't need to worry about presenting in this call. So that's maybe the right reason there. We also have the Power Platform for Microsoft Identity and Office Admins monthly community calls happening once a month. Our platform and Microsoft Identity call actually happening this week, which is really, really cool. And then we have our 7 a.m. Thursday series, which is either Microsoft 365 Power Platform Community and Viva Connections SharePoint Framework calls. And in here, we typically have community presenters. So at least two calls every single week. This week, four calls, which is mind bubbling. Uh, so a lot of, lot of material available. You can download your recurrent invites from AKMS Community Calls URL. Also, so if you're wondering on how would you know the agendas for this course advance, so you don't have to just pop in the call and then know that is it interesting or not, you can actually uh, register or follow up on uh, the agenda details in the AKMS community meetup. And that's a great service uh, where we always publish the community call agendas uh, roughly a week before the call. So you'll know advance what you, which calls you want to actually attend or not.
Now, I did mention that some of the calls have a community presenters. We do welcome community presenters, uh, in, especially on Thursday calls and some of the monthly calls as well. Uh, and the easiest way to actually get there to present is just by signing up on our form. So this is a relatively easy process. You'll sign up on AKMS community request demo, and then we'll contact you related on the details, availability, and get you scheduled on the call. If you're wondering on getting more, let's say, presentation experience or getting to be an MVP, this is a great opportunity to do that. Or if you want to just do a one call every now and then to share your learnings, that's completely fine as well. Really, really awesome opportunity for everybody. Now, if you're wondering how to get started on doing Microsoft 365 development, uh, you can subscribe to Microsoft 365 developer program. You will get a free E5 developer tenant, which will renew every single 90 days automatically as long as you use it for developer usage. We also have a lot of, lot of, lot of mod uh, training modules available in the Microsoft Learn for you to benefit and learn the relevant technologies for you. We also have three different uh, podcasts or video blogs, uh, depending on Peter about the setup. Uh, so Microsoft 365 Dev Podcast uh, is hosted by Jeremy Fake and Paul Shufflin and Aisha Boss, and there they focus on partner storytelling. Partner storytelling. That is English. Yes, it is. Partner storytelling right now, uh, and that's in the podcast format. We have our Microsoft 365 PMP weekly, which is happening in both video and in the podcast format. And then we have our Power Platform Connections, hosted by David Warner and Hugo Bernier, happening and as a weekly video blog right now in the Power Platform YouTube channel. Really, really, really awesome ways of say, staying up to date on what's happening. Now, I did mention already the samples, just to promote that one one more time, AKMS forward slash community forward slash samples. All of the Microsoft and community provided samples from one centralized location. So rather than going to a GitHub repo, realizing that there's 60 samples there and which of these is implemented on which technology and what would be beneficial for me, let's offer you a text box and filtering mechanisms and a one centralized portal to find all the relevant samples for you. Really, really great way of getting started to find what's available. And we have 1,548, if I remember correctly, is the current number on the samples. And that's mind-boggling. Thank you, everybody, for contributing. We also have our sharing and caring initiative. Um, I will double check. Uh, did David, he did not, yeah, he was unable to join the call. He is actually in the MVP summit, so that was the assumption. Um, but our sharing and caring initiative is here to help you to get started. And these are remote sessions where, um, where we've joined to the Microsoft Teams meetings and we teach you how to get started on so doing certain things. So for example, getting started on using the GitHub samples or contributing your samples to others to benefit or some of the really, really popular ones is writing for the web. So there is a team of MVPs and Microsoft employees who are running the Sharing is Caring initiative and it's really there for you to help you to get started on your journey uh, to contribute and also consuming the samples which are available. Now, one way of also engaging with the with the community uh, is to join on our uh, conferences. Uh, so next big one will be the Microsoft 365 conference happening in May 2nd to May 4th, 2023. So within a few weeks, and this one will be in Las Vegas. Um, there's gonna be a awesome set of CVPs and presidents from Microsoft with some new announcements. So there's gonna be some really, really cool new features uh, re uh, announced within the Microsoft 365 within this conference. Now, this, if you are more based in Europe and you don't have the option to travel or you don't wanna travel, you can also join us on a European Collaboration Summit in 2023. That's happening on May 24th to 26th uh, at Dusseldorf, a really convenient location, centralized airport uh, and a convenient airport as well, super close to the city. And there will be 20 500 attendees and, and a lot of people from Microsoft and from MVPs and community members as well. Great way of engaging uh, across the world as well. ECS is absolutely brilliant. I can see Gavin, your heart on the chat as well. Thank you for that. Now, if you're more based in the uh, US and uh, the DC's uh, 365 Edugon is the first one which is happening there of the bigger one, bigger conferences. Uh, that's on June 12th to June 16th. A lot of pre conference workshops and awesome, awesome presenters there as well. Great opportunity to meet people in person. We also have the European uh, Power Platform Conference happening in Dublin 20 to 22nd of June, and that closes up kind of the, the this half of the calendar year. But this is a great venue. I've been actually in the D Dublin venue. It is a really, really cool uh, convenient location to have a conference, and there's going to be a lot of, lot of great speakers in this one as well.
Now, if you're wondering then, okay, so what about the other ones? Yes, there's a lot of, lot of events and opportunities to engage a bit in a smaller group of conferences and, and events as well. So if you go to the communitydays.org, you will see all of the different uh, community organized or community related uh, sessions uh, across the world. So we'll have sessions uh, or community has sessions in Ohio, Algarve, Portugal, Western, uh, Virginia, Mexico City, and so on. So a lot of, lot of stuff happening uh, across the world as well. So these are great opportunities to be in a bit smaller group of uh, people. Um, and also they're great opportunities for you to potentially to start in your career, presentation career or speaking career if you're interested on in that as well. Now, this week's news, uh, not a massive amount of news across the different blocks and channels, which we typically go through in here. Uh, on the Microsoft 365 Developer Blog, there was updates to the Microsoft 365 Developer Program, just to recap on what the program is all about from Kelly Bauer and McCombs, and also uh, a refresh on some of the adjustments which we're doing related on automatic renewal there. Now, there was also a, a blog post related on enabling billing for Microsoft Teams APIs uh, in Microsoft Craft by Ajib uh, and Amit, and just to call this out. It is not all of the Microsoft Teams uh, APIs. It's only a really, really small subset of APIs which will have a cost related on them. Uh, and it's only those kind of a massive, handling massive amount of information. Uh, but that blog post really talks about well, how, what does that mean in practice and how do you enable the billing within your tenant uh, or within your application. And then there was a really interesting uh, blog post from Alexis Ginzelin uh, related on deploy your chat GPT based model securely using Microsoft Teams Power Virtual Agent and Azure Open AI. Really, really awesome blog post, step-by-step -step guidance on how would I combine all of these together and take advantage of that Azure Open AI within your solutions. On the right side, and uh, these are actually coming from the SharePoint blog. Uh, so the support update for SharePoint 2013 workflows uh, in Microsoft 365. And this is actually quite important. So we are publicly announcing a deprecation of SharePoint 2013 workflow and recommending openly people uh, or officially people to start using Power Automate as the right uh, workflow engine. Now, they will, uh, the workflow, SharePoint 2013 workflow will be turned off for new tenants starting from April 2nd, 2024. If you have an existing tenant, and that will have that feature still enabled until April 2nd, 2026. So that's three years heads up on that we are shutting down and the, the SharePoint 2013 workflow. Now, from the name, you can already see that SharePoint 2013 workflow, it's pretty old. We all do know that it's widely used, but it's more than a decade uh, old technology. So it's good that we are evolving towards uh, the cloud technologies as well. And then there was a really cool blog post related on request external files to your SharePoint document libraries. And that is a really interesting title because it's like, wait, what? But what it means is that you can actually, in a document library, you can generate a link and share that link with somebody like your partners or colleague, uh, partner external companies uh, which you're working with and ask them to upload, for example, project files or contract details to that document library. So you basically give them the link and the location where they can share uh, their files and they are able to upload, but they cannot see the other files within the library. So really, really cool extranet kind of a type of scenario to make sure that files are in a right location. So super, super cool blog post on that. Now, before we go to the actual demos and starts of the day, we do have a one uh, quick recap on last week's announcements. Uh, Gary, you're going to do this one. Yes, uh, so I just wanted to give an update on Teams Toolkit Cloud Skills Challenge, which uh, we announced and started last week uh, on the 12th, 12th of April. Um, so this has been headed up by Louise Fries, um, and um, yeah, it's been fantastic to see all of the uh, response uh, on socials, um, everyone getting involved uh, in the in the challenge, going through and completing it, and sharing their experiences um, as well, which is absolutely fantastic to uh, to see and to hear people getting excited about building apps for teams using teams toolkit so as a reminder it's still going we're about midway um, you can still register um, and take the, the challenge register and uh, when you're registering make sure that you uh, you accept the the t's and c's click on the link to submit the form then you'll be actually eligible potentially for a prize um, as well so don't forget that most important uh, part um, but if you want to uh, learn a little bit more, go to aka.ms slash learn teams toolkit and we'd love to hear uh, what you've been building. Okay, back to you, Vesa. 
I think with all of the uh, the effects, Vesa can find the unmute button. <laughs> I was thinking he was unusually quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I can just hear him now saying, everyone, it's optional picture time. Be like Seb. <laughs> no, yeah, we cannot hear you. Vesa, are you We're there? all ready. We have our cameras We're on. ready. Are you ready, Vesa? <laughs> so he can hear us, apparently, and he's doing things. Second Monday. <laughs> I guess that that's our cue. <laughs> Everybody cup your ears like you can't hear them. No, Vesa, you are still still no audio. You are still on mute. I mean, you must have a microphone there, one of them that works, right? Ah, technical difficulties. <laughs> Is this thing on? No, it's not. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we see you, Vesa. Say something. Ah. There you are. <laughs> you heard your screams. <laughs> Anyways, yes, apparently so. Apparently, I will be your host for the reminder of this call. With that, I think, without further ado, let's give it to John, who is going to walk us through the newest preview of Teams Toolkit version V5 and talk about new features and capabilities. Over to you, John. Thanks, Wodak. Thanks, Vesa. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about developing apps for Teams using the Teams Toolkit. So we had a little bit uh, from Gary on with the latest kind of event we've been running with that. So that was really cool feedback to see. And just want to give a little bit of an introduction to creating apps in case you're new or you haven't really looked at what it means to build apps for teams yet. Let me just go over that real fast. Uh, so first thing I think is important is an app on teams is really just a JSON file. And we refer to that as the app manifest. So. Uh, you know, this confused me a little bit when I first got started and I came from a mobile development background and I thought an app meant a very specific thing with IPA files and APKs, et cetera. Uh, but on Teams and Microsoft 365, app isn't really that. It's really this JSON mm -hmm. file that kind of defines on how you want to extend. So that's the first thing. Um, and an app is how you customize or extend functionality in Teams. So if you want to do something unique or custom in there, then an app is what you'll need to create. And the manifest is how you define exactly where and what you're customizing. Uh, you host a web content. So all of these things are hosted experiences, and it's up to you on where you want to do that. And some of the extensibility points work across Outlook and the Microsoft 365 app too. Uh, so you can build with the Teams app, uh, with the Teams manifest, but you can also run some of these things across uh, multiple hubs. So what I'm going to talk about is Teams Toolkit. This is really our dev tools for how you can get started and how you can build these apps. And there's a couple of things that that includes. Uh, it includes project templates, hosting templates uh, for Azure, and CI CD templates, and a bunch of templates to help you get started and uh, make kind of these decisions on getting things set up a little simpler. And it also includes some new features in uh, version 5, which I'll show you, which um, are kind of a way to compose the automation that's needed. And we give it this to you as a CLI tool and also as IDE extensions. Uh, so VS Code extension and a Visual Studio 2022 extension. All right, let me let me just go right into show you how to do this. I'm going to bring up uh, the chat on the other side of my screen too. If you have a question or something or something's confusing, feel free to drop in the chat and I'll try to check it as progress bars are spinning, et cetera. So I'm going to try to go through it live with you. Um, so you'll have to. Uh, bear with me as we have to watch some things spin so i'm going to use the cli uh, the teams FX cli to get started um, you can also use the vs code extension i'll jump into that in a minute but uh, i think the cli tool is pretty easy to get started and we don't show that as often yeah thanks a lot of cd continuous deployment uh, so you can install the cli tool um, from npm and I actually did have that up here so that's on here so it's a at microsoft teams FX cli and you can just install it here. I'm using, I think, the alpha version here. 
because that is the latest uh, to have all of the new functionality that I'm showing. So if you want to follow along, you'll have to install either the beta or the alpha. I think I'm using the latest alpha. Uh, to get started with a new project, you can just do TeamsFX new. And then I'll walk you through a couple steps on choosing uh, an app type for Teams. Um, so I'm going to create a new app and I'm just going to choose a notification bot. I think that's the simplest to demonstrate. And this is a way for you to send a message in Teams uh, based on a couple of different uh, triggers on how you want to trigger that message. So I'm going to choose that and I'll just choose the default for an HTTP trigger. So I can send a post um, to my API endpoint and then that will post a chat message in Teams. So if I want to take some data or uh, let some users know that something has happened, maybe in my business system, then this is a way you can just bring that into Teams as a simple chat message. I'll choose that. Defaults are fine. And uh, that's my, just give my app a name here. Good to that. All right, so that's that. And let's go into my bot app and let's take a look at what that has. So I'm gonna open it in VS Code and just show you the, the scaffolding. So this is something that has changed. Uh, is there a reason not to use Yeoman? Uh, no, there's not a reason not to use it. Uh, I think some of the reasons that you might choose differently, you could start with the Yeoman Jenner if you want, and then you could also use uh, these tools in combination. So they, we're trying to give flexibility for developers to kind of use whatever tools they want. So if you have a preference on how you scaffold projects, that's fine. Uh, we have different templates in our tools uh, and some different opinions on what those scaffoldings look like. So it's up to you. You can also start with the Yeoman generator and then you know adopt the things you like about the Teams Toolkit. Um, if you want to be able to F5 from VS Code and run them across hubs, et cetera. So I can I can show you some of that in a minute. So this is the kind of default project structure that we give across all of our scaffolds. The first thing you have is an app package folder. This is where the, the JSON manifest lives. So this is this is your app. And there's a couple opinions that we express on here by default. Uh, we give you uh, some placeholder values in here that can be replaced by the tooling. For example, you can see already, uh, like there's no ID defined here. Uh, there's just this uh, syntax for replaceable variables. And we kind of do that throughout the manifest. Um, like there's no bot ID here. And the reason we do this is so that way you can configure multiple environments. So I can host um, a bot and an, a Teams app locally um, for like my web experience and have debugging and support from uh, Visual Studio or VS Code. And then I can also not have to duplicate all this in order to have another environment, like a staging environment or a production environment. I can use one manifest and keep that in my source control. And then the way you can control all that is through environment files. Uh, so for example, this Teams app ID maps over to this environment variable inside this local file. And we haven't defined it yet because I haven't actually run the tooling. So you have your app package. That's where the team's kind of specific stuff is. That's the manifest file and the two icons that are required. So that's on disk. You could check that into source control. Uh, you have your environment files. Uh, we have some defaults for hosting using bicep files for Azure. That's what the info folder is. You don't have to use that if you want to host a different way or host a different place. Uh, we give that to you by default on the tooling setup to be able to do that. And we give you two environments by default, a local, so you can run uh, with the tooling uh, and host things locally. And then also the dev environment is like the default remote environment. So you could, uh, and that uses the Azure templates. And then the source folder is where the actual implementation of whatever the template is you chose. For example, I chose the notification bot. So in here is an implementation of a RESTify server to handle my API endpoints and post something in chat. So here's my, uh, here's my endpoint API notification. And uh, here's what it does. It basically builds a very simple adaptive card and sends it uh, to Teams using our SDK. So let me go back here uh, to my CLI. Uh, the first thing, oh, you know, there's one thing I have to do in order for this to run. We, just, we take a look inside the manifest file. There's these IDs and stuff that need to be uh, handled. But in order for our bot to run, this is what the toolkit does. So in new in version five is uh, these YAML files. Let me take a look at what these do. I'm just going to minimize some of these because I think it's a little easier to demonstrate. There's a lot of prerequisites that have to happen on the platform for you to actually run a bot. 
So you have to create your Teams app. So you have to normally you would go to Teams developer portal and create a registration and then copy the ID into a manifest file or something like that. You have to create an Azure AD app for the bot. You have to create something in bot framework or Azure bot service um, and then link all those things up and paste in URLs. And there's a lot of documentation on the platform to do all that manually. The toolkit helps you automate all these with uh, basically our own definition of a task runner. So you can think of something like Gulp or Grunt or something like that, but it's tuned specifically for Teams apps. And so that's what this file is. And it uh, should look a little familiar if you've used things like uh, GitHub Actions or uh, an Azure DevOps pipeline file. It's modeled very similar to that. So you can see there's a couple steps here. Uh, we have these higher level instructions, which are the steps. So I have two defined provision and deploy. So I've broken out kind of the automation of my process uh, for creating this app into two different steps, provision and deploy. And the provision step will create a Teams app for me, create the AAD app for my bot, create a bot framework registration, and then it will do some stuff for the uh, manifest. It will validate it, make sure that the scheme is right, make sure there's no other um, problems with it that would fail like publishing to my tenant, um, zip it up and upload it to Teams developer portal. And that's what uh, Teams app update does. So it kind of automates all these things. And then each of these steps has some parameters that you can define, that you can customize if you want to. So for creating my app, here's the name of my app. And I've added a suffix for the environment so I can easily see as my app's running in Teams, if it's my local one or my staging one or my QA one or whatever, um, I can tweak the name of that. And then it saves the ID that it will create in the Teams app ID environment variable. So this is kind of the inputs and then these are the outputs. And that pattern's kind of repeated throughout these different uh, actions. So here's one, create the Azure AD app for the bot and then it outputs uh, what is created there to these environment files. And that's that maps to these over here. So what I can do now is I can just press F5 uh, straight from the toolkit and just start debugging. So you can see I have um, some debug launch profiles by default that's scaffolded for you if you create with the tooling. So you can just start debugging and basically we'll go through all of these steps. You can see some of that down here as a toolkit does some prerequisite checks to make sure your development environment locally has like Node.js installed and that you have an account set up. Uh, I've already logged into the tools with my Microsoft 365 developer program account, so I already have an environment that I can run this in that has the permissions and everything I need. And it will go through these different steps. So right now it's going to run the provision step first and it's going to go through and you can see it's going through these actions. Um, and it will go through each of these as I've defined, and then it will, and then next it will do the deploy step. And this one might take a few, like a minute or two, because it's going to run npm install on this project. So once that's ready, then the the browser will launch. And something else that's new um, in the toolkit, if you're unfamiliar, is we have a new task for handling tunneling for you. So that's defined in task.json. Uh, which is, you know, relies on VS code. And you can see here we have our own tasks here to start a tunnel, configure the ports, and you can you could tweak this if you wanted to. You can change uh, the parameters here. And when it creates that tunnel, it's going to save uh, the endpoint to these environment variables. So that way, whenever you press F5, all the things that need to be updated in the Azure portal, like the bot framework registration and your redirect URLs, anywhere that you want to have that dynamic URL, you could put in this uh, this environment variable. So that's going to run and then let me make sure I don't miss the browser popping up over here. Probably launch on my other screen. Just reading chat to see if there's any questions. Submitted in TTAR. Hmm. Any preset up for tunneling via NGROC? Um, we used to default to using NGROC. Um, but we don't default to that now. Um, and now we're defaulting to like the built-in uh, VS Code kind of dev, dev tunnels feature. So that's what we're using here. You could swap this out if you want. Um, I forget the exact syntax, but there's another type here. It might just be ngrok. I forget exactly what it is. We have the, it's in the documentation, but you can choose whatever you want. The other thing you could do is um, you could just run ngrok 
here uh, with the same ports and then get the URL and just paste it in uh, to those environment variables. So you could go in here and then you could paste it in your, your NGROC URL here. You can see it's uh, the tooling's already put in my dev tunnels URL. And so you can just update this with your tunnel URL if you have some other tool that you want to use. And then if this is already filled in, the tooling won't replace it. It'll just use it. Uh, so you can do that. Same with um, same with uh, the IDs. If you already have a Teams app ID, you just paste it in here. Um, and same with a bot ID. You could just paste it in here. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to use all these steps to create things fresh if you don't want to. The, the nice thing is if you check these things in and then another developer wants to collaborate and they don't have those environment variables filled in, then the tooling can help create them with the account that they have signed in. So I have the Teams Toolkit ex extension installed in VS Code. You can see I already have my identities signed in here. You can do the same thing uh, with the CLI as well. Um, there's a Teams effects count uh, command, and there's a way for you to uh, sign in with Azure or sign in with M365, and then that'll be the identity that your uh, CLI tool uses. So the extension does the same thing. You can see the extension does a couple other things in here. It shows you the different environments you have configured. So these map to the, the names of the files that I have. So I have a local and a dev, and then there's some other, uh, you can see it, it also detects the different lifecycle steps that I have inside of, uh, my YAML files. So here I have a provision, a deploy, and a publish step. And that is what these link to. Just checking chat while this launches. All right, so this is finally launching in Teams. So what the tooling has done is it gone through all those steps, created all those, automated all the um, creation of all the kind of uh, platform resources I needed. So the Teams app ID, uh, the bot framework registration, the uh, the AAD app for the bot, configured all those things, and now it's side loading on Teams for me. So I can uh, just run the app here. So we'll get the similar experience if you were to just take the zip file and package it manually. You can do that here automatically with the toolkit. So we should get a little dialogue here to add our app to Teams. And then while that's running, um, we can test it uh, with just, I think, just post uh, a message to it. And what is the URL? I think we have to go back and get our URL here. So back in VS Code. Get my URL. And the API that I showed you earlier was API.notification. So put that over here for a second. Once we add the app, we should be able to just test it. Get that out of the way. Here's our app. And I think we can just run this. Then once that executes, we should see our notification in Teams. So there's our bot running. That's working. And then back in VS Code. We could set breakpoints and debug if we want to, uh, if we're using uh, either VS or VS Code. So that's uh, set up. It's, it's very simple if you're using VS Code. You can just uh, scaffold a new project and press F5 and everything's um, kind of automated for you. But what's nice in the new version is now if you need to understand exactly what all of that is doing, you can just look through the instructions of these YAML files. So there's two by default. One is for the local environment. There's some things that uh, we don't do in this file by default, like host everything in Azure. Whereas teamsapp.yaml is where you would kind of define your production environments. Uh, what that looks like. So provision looks a little different there by default. So what we give you, you can see there's a step here to deploy with ARM. It's going to use it in the Azure subscription, whatever that is defined as, whatever the whatever resource group name you want. And then it's going to use these templates, which are included by default in here. 
And then some of the other stuff is the same. So I might want to do a validate the manifest, et cetera. I can make this simpler if I want. For example, if I want to speed things up, um, I don't have to validate the manifest if I don't want to. Maybe I don't care in my local environment. Um, so I can just delete that. And now the toolkit won't validate the manifest. So just skip that step. Uh, maybe I don't need to run npm co uh, commands, or maybe I want to run an additional one for my project if I have some different setup over here. Um, or there's even, uh, I think there's even autocomplete in these things too. So you can do, um, you can choose what step you want to do. And I think there's even one if you just want to run a generic script. So you can, uh, you know, whatever you want to run, you know, yo something uh, or npm something or whatever, or even .NET something. Uh, I think I, I've used that before to uh, take older samples and convert them to use a toolkit, and maybe they use a different tool chain. Um, then I can just, as part of my deploy step, I can run some generic scripts to be able to run this, or you can run PowerShell scripts if you have something like that. Maybe your deployment process doesn't use bicep files and don't use ARM and all that. Maybe you have some other custom things. So then your provision or deploy, you might need control over that. So you can you can kind of build this out as you want. And we have a bunch of different uh, tasks that are tuned specifically uh, for the steps that we have seen folks do when they're building apps. So all of that's documented on the GitHub repo. Um, but then there's autocomplete in here that helps you uh, kind of find your way. But if you are completely lost, then you can go to the GitHub repo and see all the actions to find and what their outputs are, et cetera. Cool. I'm just going to check chat to make sure there's no other questions. Yeah, any way to permanently dismiss that thing? I don't know. <laughs> I've tried many times. It's that every time I run it, that thing pops up. Uh, I'll go through the chat here in a second and uh, answer any questions that I missed. But oh. if you want to check it out, let me just uh, recap. Bring this up here. Yeah, so if you want to get started, GitHub repo is probably the simplest way. So one link you have to remember, it's under the office dev org, and then it's slash teams FX. And that is where you can find the links to uh, pretty much everything I showed. And then if you have feedback or questions, TTK feedback is a good place to, to email. That goes to our entire team, including the engineering. So we triage that and discuss it internally. And um, that's a great way to, to talk with all of us or say, hey, this thing's not working or, hey, I don't understand or, hey, our our company needs X and this isn't working. Uh, it's a great place to do that. Or if you want to chat with me directly, have something more, maybe more nuanced or you want to share feedback one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you can use the AKMS link uh, here, TTK hyphen chat, and that will help you schedule a meeting directly with me. Cool. All right. That's what I have to awesome. share for you. Thank you. Excellent. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, John, uh, on doing that. Uh, really, really cool demos. A lot of great feedback on the chat as well. And thank you, Luis, on running the, the Teams Toolkit uh, setup uh, right now as well. Now, next in the line, we have Rohit to talk about uh, his contribution on the Microsoft Graph Hackathon. Uh, Waldek, do you want to do a quick intro uh, if Rohit is sharing or how do we want to do this? Absolutely, absolutely. Let me say a word or two. Meanwhile, that gives uh, Rohit time to sorry, Rohan. Uh, sorry, uh, Rohan. Yeah, sorry. yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm following you. Uh, that gives him uh, the time to share his screen, and I'll do the intro. So, over the last few weeks, we've seen AI do everything, right? From generating images to generating audio, summarizing text. One thing that we haven't seen it doing though is to call the Microsoft Graph. Some say that you could do it, and actually, you can. So you are about to see a demo where you can use AI to call the Microsoft Graph, and that is really, really cool. So with that, over to you, Rahan. Uh, disclaimer, this is my first community call, and I'm glad to be presenting. So I'll just quickly go ahead. Um, there might be minor hiccups, um, as is with all live presentation, so please bear with me. Um, quickly moving on to the screen share. So uh, for the Microsoft Hack Together Hackathon, I built Magi, which is basically a hack which combines uh, the power of Microsoft Graph and hooks it up with LLM magic to uh, give you a wizard, like uh, like in uh, not in a literal sense, a figurative wizard who's able to help you with all your Microsoft Graph usage. I'll start by playing the demo I'd made for the hackathon so that all of, all of us are up to speed. Magi is a smart AI which answers your queries using the power of the Microsoft Graph API. 
That response was verbose. Let's only ask for the given names of the employees. You can do much more than simply view the employees. How about checking up on the unread emails of a user? Or the latest events on their calendar? All this and so much more is possible with Magi. And the magic behind Magi is the powerful Microsoft Graph API. Yep. So for if you miss out on what happened in the demo, the uh, Magi is basically a command line tool where you can issue queries for anything uh, re related to your Microsoft 365 data, which can be fulfilled by Graph API. So that could range anywhere from uh, viewing your to-do list or to even say something more involved like uh, checking up on your e-discovery cases. So how Magi was born was, it was basically my answer to the question, what if I can just talk with the Microsoft Graph? So Microsoft Graph is an impressive piece or impressive framework for building intelligent apps. It's got tremendous documentation and excellent toolkit. Uh, and there's also they're already a way of the Graph Explorer to play around with the Microsoft APIs. However, uh, it's still more steps than we would like to. Uh, a user might not want to figure out all the authentication, all the permissions required for a particular API, and what are, what are the permutations you can call the API with. What if all that could be simpl simplified to the user where you could just, in a way, command the Microsoft Graph API? So that's the core reason for building Magi. And it has three building blocks. It's a command and application. Uh, it uses the ChatGPT API and it relies on Microsoft Graph. I'll go into detail uh, in each of these building blocks and there will be code. So I will share the snippets of code we used to build a hack. So here's the flow of how Magi works. So first, a user issues a query to Magi. Uh, so, and the secret sauce of Magi is it relies on the ChatGPT API to actually uh, decode the a user query into HTTP requests, which it can for Microsoft Graph. So after the ChatGPT API returns the HTTP request for Microsoft Graph, Magi takes care of all the authentication permissions and the, all the scaffolding and makes a graph request and surfaces the re graph response to the user. Magi was built in approximately two days, and the reason I was able to build this in such a quick time with quick turnaround was because of the Vibrant.net ecosystem. I had, for all the functionality I wanted, there was a package to get me started and so that I didn't have to deal with the details of what I need of, of say, stuff which is required, but rather I could focus on the stuff which I wanted to do. So for the command line, I relied on a new system.command line package, which is in preview. The ChatGPT API was delivered through an open AI community supported package. And Microsoft Graph was built, the support for Microsoft Graph came from the Graph SDK. Uh, going a bit into the uh, CLI parts. So system.command line is a new package, which is currently in preview. And it's a fluent way of describing command line applications. Um, uh, you don't have to take uh, read the args which you pass into main anymore and deal ensure that all the types are right, all the options are given correctly, and do the validations and all. It's a fluent interface for building CLI apps in a very quick manner. In uh, it's such quick that the CLI skeleton of Magi was just 16 lines. So here's a snippet of how all the CLI stuff for Magi. I basically uh, specified the argument, which was a query, which 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 the user would provide to Magi. Then I specified a command, which is the Magi functionality itself. And I could even easily specify options, like if the user wants to specify a configuration file for their AAD tenant and et cetera, they can even specify it an option. And after hooking it up through a, a set handler and stuff, it was ready to go. And then here, here's the fun part. How do I make ChatGPT understand Microsoft Graph? So LLMs are tremendous technology, and we're still discovering what all is possible through them. 
when OpenAI announced the ChatGPT API, I was intrigued and I wanted to see how I could fit in the API with the hackathon, and that's how I get, got started on it. To make use of the ChatGPT API, I use the community-made OpenAI library, which gives a very .NET native interface for working with the API. Moving on to the most important part of the hack was how do I get ChatGPT to generate the correct HTTP requests to hit graph. So the key was prompt engineering, which is basically you instruct ChatGPT to do something and then you iterate upon those prompts so as to you so that you arrive at something which gives you what you want to a acceptable manner so here you can see the prompt i've used to make magi work i was basically um the first sentence itself you are an ai assistant um i basically asked chat gpt to assume the role of magi and i guided it how it would work an important part of making it work was so that I could identify the HTTP request correctly. So what I instructed was, you should only provide me the responses in this form, HTTP verb or an end, endpoint. I had to do this because if, if you have used ChatGPT uh, so far, you know that it is verbose and it could go on and on and on about various stuff related to the question you asked instead of directly answering it. I wanted a straightforward response so that I could easily parse it and make the Microsoft graph request. Coming to how the graph SDK worked, so one piece which I had to take care of is that the graph SDK is very structured. In order to make a request for the user's API, you would use graph client.users.get async or something like that. The issue I had, a user of Magi could make a query for any arbitrary endpoint. It could it could range from users to to do and all. Mapping all these quests to a specific graph request is not trivial because there can be a number of permutations. So what I did was I used the graph client factory to get me an instance of the graph base client, which is basically an a HTTP client on steroids, which with an authentication provider and other niceties which with which you can easily make graph requests so once you obtain a, H, a client graph client from the graph client factory all it's all a matter of populating the http request message and making that request uh, before i delve into questions i'll go a bit deeper into the code so what you're seeing right now is magi in its entirety so all these are the imports and then this is system message is a prompt which i shared earlier but i'm basically instructing chat gpt to uh, give me the response in this manner going down we have all the cli stuff the query argument which to take query from the user the config file argument option and uh, so what happens is after i hit the chat gpt api with the user's query and it returns the http request I pass the request, pass the response, sorry, and then I create a graph client and make the HTTP request message. So I check the response and then I create a graph request. I do authorization and I simply send the HTTP request. I get a response, I print it in a pretty manner and I show it to the user. And yeah, that's the magic behind Magi. I'll like I'll show perhaps a live demo like of one or one use case just to like cement that is actually working. So here I'm asking the names of the employees in the company, and here you see this get is what the ChatGPT API response. So I'm able to take this information and make further calls. For instance, the hundred emails of a particular user. So here you can see that this is the uh, ChatGPT API response, and I'm able to build on top of it to fulfill the user's query. If you've got any questions, uh, please ask them. Like I'm not able to look at the chat because of some weird error. So I would love it if someone could feel a like narrate a question. Now, 
Rohan, I can, I guess I hear, I can, I can work as a, a kind of a few comments and questions. Uh, I have to call out the amount of code within your solution is just spot on because it actually shows the power of SDKs, right? So you're basically yes. using the existing combination, but that's the beauty of modern developers as well. It's not about the amount of code. It's about how do you combine the existing libraries. So really awesome stuff there. And somebody was saying, are you a uh, Harry Potter? Uh, so because of the, <laughs> you know, the amount of the, the things work surprisingly well. Uh, is there a documentation on this in GitHub? Have, I know that you have a repo uh, available on that on yep. the solution um, and it has some level of a documentation. Again, it's magical how simple it is, but it's still incredibly powerful. Uh, so it, it just really shows the flexibility of those APIs and, and how you combine the implementation. And, and I think one of the key magic, I don't know, how, how long does it Say, did it take you to create the the instructions for OpenAI? Um, so the the prompting. Um, it took me around two hours. Um, I found the process very uh, interactive and fun. Like you are essentially teaching this mold of clay how to behave, how you want it to behave. <laughs> so that yeah. part was like super fun and it's it was engaging. Yeah. How, how did you solve uh, what is the right prompt for doing that? Uh, is that just running documentation and examples or how did you do that? It was an iterative process with a lot of trial and error. And yeah. One thing I found which helped me was I tried to view the mental model of like I thought of myself as chat GPT and say what would be a specific set of instructions which are so tightly scoped to what I want. Yeah. So like wearing a hat and like thinking about it helps. Yeah. And I, I have to say this is an absolutely brilliant example. We've been, there's this classic ongoing meme joke related on everybody will be a prompt engineer at some point um, because now the AI is taking over the world. But but that's part of the game, right? So it's part of the the now the tool set. Are you afraid, just out of curiosity for uh, before we go to that and close up the call, are you Rohan afraid of losing your job because say, hey, AI is taking over the world and then be, you know, developers are no longer needed. What's your feeling based on this exercise? Uh, if anything, AI would help me make, do my job much better. And if at all we ever reach a point that I'm jobless because of an AI, I'll probably move on to more fun things. Yeah, absolutely. That I personally, I, I do agree on that thinking. It's the, I think whenever we introduced cars back in 19 or whatever, 10, people were afraid that people, you know, horses are no longer needed and yep. everybody's losing their job and blah, blah, blah. That's not the case. It's evolution. It's an abstraction of things and we can focus on more meaningful uh, functionalities So or, or tasks as a humans. So really, really cool. Thank you, Rohan. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, really, really, really cool demo and, and a great demo, a great solution. I, I love the amount of code and you, how you openly shared also the code that this isn't too much. Uh, it's really a power of yeah. combining the right libraries. So, yeah. Um, if anyone ever wants to like uh, reach out and have a chat with me, I'm, I'm available on LinkedIn. So you can just go linkedin.com slash in slash rank, rank B and hit me up. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. And Rohan, feel free to add those links in the chat. Uh, it's just easier for, for you know, clicking them, uh, what you had on the slides as well. Really, really cool. Awesome stuff. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Now, uh, that was today we had John and Rohan. Uh, it's it's actually good that we didn't have the third demo, so we didn't have to rush on any of the things. Uh, it's it's a combination of always the challenge. There's high demand for the demo slots, but then um, that's why we have to pick the three. But then having a two is, is not necessarily a bad thing because we have more time on, on doing the demos. Um, next week, we right now have three demos scheduled. Uh, so on 25th of April, we have Stuart McCartney and Marco Castro talking about why build power solutions uh, as in Power Platform solutions uh, in Microsoft Teams. Uh, we have Gary Trinter talking about bringing your existing project to Teams Toolkit. So what if, if you are not starting from Greenfield, if you are not starting with a new solution, which is actually quite often the case. And then we have Ahmad Mosar, who's the last on the Microsoft Craft Hackathon winner series. And uh, these are really, really great uh, solutions. Thank you, Rohan, one more time on that one. Uh, and But next week, Ahmad is going to show Magic Note app to plan the day efficiently with AI and Microsoft Graph. And again, AI functionalities uh, shown there. Now,
we always uh, nowadays also ask feedback about this call. So if you have an opportunity or a few minutes, this is not a long form. It's intended to be a really quick form to fill in. Please give us feedback that the AKMS community calls and feedback. I will add that link in the chat after the call as well. Uh, really helps us on adjusting uh, the agendas and, and also adjusting the content what we're covering here. The recording will be available in 24 hours at the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Community YouTube channel at AKMS community, forward slash community forward slash videos. You cannot access the recording and directly from chat, even though Teams kind of implies that you would be able to do that, but that only works for Microsoft employees, so not for the external people. So that's why we always publish the recording within 24 hours. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel or follow people in, in Twitter, uh, you will uh, notice uh, whenever the recording is available. Typically, I'll try to add it in in the chat as well, so you immediately know that. The next call is in 25th, so we already went through the agenda, and I guess that's it for now. We're hitting the hour as well. Thanks everybody for joining. Really awesome demos today by John and, and Rohan. Really, really great. And thank you everybody for joining today. Have a safe rest of the week, and we'll be in touch. See you next time. Bye-bye.